Hello and welcome to the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Dave Birnbaum. Dave leads product and marketing for CoinBits, the oldest Bitcoin-only exchange. Based in Nashville now, Dave worked in Silicon Valley for 15 years, developing hardware and software for VR, gaming, mobile phone, and wearables. Dave is a prolific inventor with over 100 granted patents, and his product designs have shipped in hundreds of millions of consumer devices. With the team at CoinBits, Dave is helping to build the superhuman of money apps by combining seamless fiat and Bitcoin services. Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity and it's a real honor to be here. I mean, I'm sure you've heard it from like every guest, but Bitcoin Standard was critical in my orange pilling process. I, um, I read it in lockdown in 2020 and changed everything for me. So thank you for that. And uh, the books after that have also been wonderful. So it's a huge honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Um, especially coming from somebody who's uh, made all of these uh, things, actual things that uh, people buy and wear all over the world. So I guess let's begin with that. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you went from uh, all of these uh, patents and inventions and products into Bitcoin. Yeah, so my, my background started out in um, really interface design and I became interested. I was actually in music school at the time and I became interested in how musicians use their bodies to perform music and how they're able to express themselves by sort of applying the forces of their body and their, their, their gestures uh, to this physical object that then results in expression and, and music. And that led me down sort of a, a path of learning musical instrument design. And I was able to create several instruments that uh, take advantage of sort of the, the psychology of humans and the physiology of humans to create new forms of music with electronics and sensors and so on. Um, and that was an interesting process that taught me a lot about the human body. And um, what was interesting about that too is um, I realized that the sense of touch is sort of um, not, is underutilized in um, not only musical instruments, but really throughout all of our interfaces. Um, you know, the sense of touch has been neglected pretty much this entire time. When I was starting my career, there was even less of it. Now we're used to the idea of your phone is like poking you or vibrating, or you can feel the keys as you type. Your game controllers are giving you a sense of presence and, and um, touch. Uh, and in VR now, you're also able to touch virtual objects uh, in sort of a rudimentary way. Um, but back then there was none of that. And I was really inspired with this idea because you know, I think just like that's the same reason that I'm uh, attracted to Bitcoin. I, I really look for big, complicated problems and sort of like universal framings. And, um, you know, Bitcoin offers this universal frame of being like, you know, a lot of the problems that we have uh, roll up to the problems with fiat and Bitcoin's a solution. And at the time, I kind of had the same sort of reductive approach. And I was like, you know, there's a lot of optimism at the time around technology. You know, Ray Kurzweil wrote. Um, the singularity is near. And at the time, I really thought we were, we were going to transcend like human limitations, if only we could create better interfaces so that we could interact through the internet more naturally. Um, and I saw people sort of turning against technology. And I remember reading in the tech press, and you think it was like TechCrunch, same thing happened with, with The Verge, like these big media publications that were supposed to be covering this incredibly exciting, I mean, we live in the Renaissance of technology. I mean, the explosion of capabilities and experiences is, is like, we, we live in it, so it's hard to keep track, but, you know, nobody's in history has ever lived through anything like this before. So there's so much to be optimistic about. And yet people started to turn against technology. And I, I thought about that and I was like, you know, I think part of the issue is there's this sense of alienation when you, you feel like you're reduced to something smaller than your, your whole self, you know, your whole human body. And maybe the problem is where the reason people are rude to each other online and they can't connect naturally and emotionally is because their body is neglected. Um, and we can use technology to both capture body movements and also display um, forces back to you, you know, even like a warm hug or a handshake or a high five, like these types of natural things that we do and connect as people um, we, we don't have those on the internet. And so maybe the, the, it, the problem with sort of the, the, the loss of optimism in technology has something to do with this. So um, like I said, at the time, it was really this, this kind of grand vision to, 
to bring people together, you know, to create greater harmony <laughs> in the world. Um, and, it, and we did that, actually, um, not, not to the extent that I had hoped, but um, there was a lot of progress there. Um, and eventually, though, with the advent of platforms and really like everything having to be um, sort of integrated into one of these enormous tech platforms, um, rather than sort of new companies coming and, and providing protocols and sort of neutral new experiences, everything has to be locked into these walled gardens um, and, and attention has to be monetized. I mean, at some point it became clear the internet economy is going to be driven by attention. It's going to be driven by ads and engagement. And the name of the game is simply maximizing that engagement. And if some, you know, good, good effects of togetherness and socialization come as a result of that downstream, great. But we're not building that because there's no business. The business is here. Um, and I understand that that's an interesting problem to solve. And I helped solve it. And it was... It, it was a fascinating time, but it just, at some point, you know, a year went by, two years, and I just was like, wait a minute, like, what happened to the original vision? Um, and so as that role sort of naturally ended, I was um, really curious to to branch out and to, to kind of reset and and find something that would be as motivating as, as it felt in those early days. And, um, you know, Bitcoin happened sort of naturally for me. I was... Um, I was um, investigating other technologies as a part of my research for my, for my main job. And I, I wound up looking into crypto and I've always been sort of a privacy advocate as well. So I got uh, very interested in like Zcash at the time because that was the block size war and Bitcoin didn't seem like it might make it. And so, um, so I was like, okay, maybe there's just some, this other thing. Um, and eventually, you know, with 2020 and sort of this, I, I think at, at, at around that time, I think if you were into Bitcoin and completely committed to it before that time, you know, kudos to you, you could see something that not everybody could see. And I think at around 2020, it became acceptable to believe in the thesis of Bitcoin just on the basis of like Lindy and network effects. And that's sort of like this unassailable, like, you know, uh, uh, idea, you can't, you can't go back from a network effect like that. And so, um, so I think a lot of people came, came around at that time. And um, so at the time, I was just really fascinated by this concept of, again, it's not a platform. It's not an app that is within a walled garden that's going to be controlled. It's a protocol, which is the way it should be. Anyone can build for it. And it does have this sort of this thesis that, that you know, we can solve big problems again. Um, and so I was really captivated by that. And I, uh, I started looking around in, in the industry and I found this, this fascinating company called Coinbits, which we can talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is, um, this is a common uh, thing that people just, uh, because tech is always moving around, people always assume that Bitcoin must be the MySpace. So where's going, where's the Facebook going to be? Where's the Instagram going to be, which is going to be Twitter, which is going to be the one that, uh, is going to be geared toward entertainment and which is the one that's going to be geared toward this and this and that. And I think there's a, there's a really powerful moment of, uh, realization and awakening when you realize oh bitcoin is actually the new bitcoin there's it's always there's always going to be new bitcoins and it's always going to be bitcoin it's always going to be the one because as you said the, the unassailable network effect and the fact that it's the only one that's decentralized and so many different things that we keep uh, you know we keep uh, discussing here in uh, this podcast and so then you got into coinbits uh, all right so tell us about that how did that happen and what did you do there Sure. So I, well, so, you know, it was locked down in California, you know, I, I decided uh, with my family, we can't tolerate this situation any longer. Um, I think, I think really the kicker for me, I mean, we were dealing with a lot. I was living in a part of uh, Los Angeles that was boarded up. There were riots. We could hear bombs going off at night. We found empty shell casings outside our house. Um, the education system is in dire straits out there. Um, you know, there was the medical tyranny and the whole thing. Um, but the kicker for me at the end of all of that is to say, oh, but we're paying a premium for this. So it's not like, oh, we're dealing with all these problems, but it's cheaper. It's no, no, it's much, much, much more expensive. You're not getting a hardship assignment bonus for living there. That's right. That's right. And so, and so, um, so we looked around, actually, we looked also at, at Texas and, um, 
you know, through, through a process, we wound up here uh, near Nashville. And I didn't even know when we moved, it wasn't even part of the calculus that, that this state would have such a tremendous Bitcoin community. Um, but it does. And, and it's, it's amazing to be here. I would have moved here for it if I had known. Um, there's Bitcoin Park, of course, and there's just a, 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 a real, you know, I think it's, it's, it's not a coincidence because the reasons I moved here were for the freedom um, and, and sort of the values and Bitcoin followed that sort of naturally through, through other channels and, and wound up here as well. So um, I love it here. Um, you know, the conference is in a few weeks. And so that's going to be um, really, really exciting. Um, and um, yeah, so more about Coinbits. Um, so, so Coinbits is the oldest Bitcoin only exchange. Um, it's been around since 2018. And uh, when I started, it had one single uh, purpose, and that was to buy Bitcoin for you with roundups. So you would link your credit cards and your debit cards, um, and we would round up your spare change to the nearest dollar and buy Bitcoin for you. Um, and you know, you, you know that story well. Um, there were a few other features, but that was really all it did, and it did it really well. We still have that feature. But what was fascinating to it to me as sort of a designer was this idea that they had sort of accidentally solved a couple of interesting design problems with Bitcoin. And again, I'm always thinking about like, how do we bring this esoteric, unintuitive technology? You know, Bitcoin's not intuitive. That's something we have to accept. How much do we hide? How much do we manage for people? How much do we educate through the use of a product? Um, and where that balance is for me is really the sweet spot. I love thinking about that. So what Roundups actually did, besides just buy you Bitcoin with your spare change, is it eliminated one of the key questions that people have when they get into Bitcoin, which is how much should I buy and when should I buy it? Um, it's really hard. It's sort of like unit bias is this thing that's always looming. The how much and when is always looming as well. And um, what, what Roundups does is it says, don't worry about it. You can get off zero without ever entering a number into an interface and deciding how much to buy or when. You just link your, your cards and we do it for you. Later on, as you sort of, you know, understand Bitcoin more and want to like increase your commitment to it, you can do that. Um, but, but that was something that I think, you know, I think we didn't even know we were doing when we were doing it. When we talked to people, that was one of the things that, that people say they liked about it. Um, and then um, the other thing that it, that it does um, sort of intuitively or, or without meaning to is it centralizes a view of your finances. So we actually talked to our users. When I first started, I started talking to people about why they like Coinbits. And they said that they like that it centralizes the view of their finances in one place and they can see all of their transactions from all of their cards. Somebody said that you know it helped them identify a couple of subscriptions that they didn't need anymore and so they could go cancel those and save some money. And um, you know, being new to all of this, I started doing research to understand like, what are we really talking about here? Um, and there's this genre of app called Personal Financial Management, PFM. Um, it's, a, it's a subset of FinTech apps and it provides you with a view of your finances It analyzes them for you. And then it gives you actionable uh, ways of you know, saving money or meeting your goals. Um, and people were using roundups for that, even though we weren't doing anything for, for them in that way. And so, I, I really saw sort of this, the, the nugget of an idea where, um, you know, people will need uh, going forward who are into Bitcoin, you still need fiat. You know, there's Bitcoin only apps that are great. Um, and some people are able to get on zero and live with no fiat. Um, I, I think that that's not obviously the mainstream. Um, and I think that um, our thesis at Coinbits is that hyper Bitcoinization is definitely going to happen. But it's not going to be a zombie apocalypse, right? So um, it's not like you're going to wake up tomorrow and fiat will be worthless and everybody will be on a Bitcoin standard. I think it's more like what you've spoken about in the past where we have this house of cards. We can like methodically over time deconstruct it, like stack up the cards, put them away and, and sort of have this peaceful, bloodless revolution. Um, but, but during the process, right, that's a, that's a long time. And um, so hyper-Bitcoinization for me is a, is a decade, uh, if not more. And during that decade, most Americans, most people in first world countries, even third world countries, they're going to need access to both currencies. Um, and they're going, and because they're people and they're busy and 
they want things to be simple. They're going to want one place to do that. And so um, I really see Coinbase like evolving very naturally into a personal financial management app and a hybrid banking app um, that will allow you to do both, both at once. And, um, and one of the things that we, we like to talk about at Coinbits is <clears throat> opinionated products, right? So in, in product design, there's, there's this concept that a product should be opinionated. You can't be everything to everybody. You have to have a point of view. You have to kind of bifurcate your audience and say, you know, if you, if you buy into this set of values or, or these goals, then use this app. And, um, you know, we were really inspired by this concept of time preference. Um, and so one of the things we're doing now is we're dividing your transaction history, doing some analysis to figure out what of your spending is high time preference, what is low time preference, and exposing that to you. And then, you know, that becomes, you know, instead of reading about time preference in a book and then try being on your own to implement the concept in your own life, we're helping you learn what that is, but also giving you kind of actionable steps to take to improve your your finances. Principles of Economics, my complete guide to understanding economics is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from safeddean.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, safeddean.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year from September to June and we'll have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course, Go to safeddean.com and sign up now. Yeah, so so how does uh, t- tell us more about how this uh, high versus low time preference spending uh, uh, distinction works in the app? I like that idea. Obviously, I'm uh, I'm very uh, into time preference. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, so I mean, at the basis, you could imagine that. It, I mean, we have some secret sauce, but very high level, you have a set of of categories of spending, and then those categories of subcategories and we can map those to high, <coughs> pardon me, higher low time preference. And, um, and, um, there's a set of defaults that we, that we use, but obviously everybody is unique. The aggregates don't work. So, um, we're going to obviously allow you to, um, set your own time preference over time and set your own goals and decide which categories belong to which. But as you spin it up, you're going to see that there are like, defaults that 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 makes sense for us um you know anything having to do with discretionary spending is going to be high time preference typically there is a uh, a benchmark that um, you should be spending less than 30 percent of your discretionary spending on uh sort of luxury items and on high time preference activities um and so we're able to give you kind of a, a badge or a rating with a little bit of a gamification element there to kind of tell you listen like you're doing okay, but you know if you want to do even better and live your values as a Bitcoiner, this is how you can do it. This is how you can eliminate uh, superfluous spending. And what's really great about it too is because we can see your transaction history because you give us that permission, we can seamlessly save for you, right? So we can say, listen, you spend um, you know twenty dollars on a Netflix subscription. Most people like Netflix, so that may not be a great idea uh, 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 example, but you have the subscription you don't really need. Rather than just canceling it, why don't you cancel it and turn it into a $20 saving habit in Bitcoin? So you're already used to budgeting for it. Let's take advantage of that and increase your, your you know, decrease your time preference, you know, with a single click. Yeah, I, th- I can see how this uh, can really be very powerful because... Um... I mean, uh, since writing the Bitcoin standard, I, uh, I I was pretty surprised at just how many people um, told me that that part of the book on time preference really resonated with them. And it's um, it's something that very, very few people had discussed before, particularly in terms of the relationship between money and time preference. And so once you start seeing it, you start seeing it everywhere and you start thinking about it uh, at all times. And it's a... Um, 
it's a really powerful lens for making decisions because the way that I see it, honestly, is that that is like the control knob for everything in your life. If you are a person, uh, because because every decision you take on everything, you know, your personal relationships, your food choices, your uh, what you do with your downtime, every single thing, uh, the, the choices that you do with your work, how you invest your money, how you invest your uh time at work, what kind of things you focus on, what kind of solutions, you know, there's that uh, saying, um, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think the way you do it is to a very large extent governed by your time preference and that it is uh, yeah, the, the time preference that governs all of those things. So, and of course, it's not the same. Some people have a high time preference in some things, but uh, not in other things. But in general, you'll see that this kind of uh, relationship between uh, how you think of the present versus the future, that uh, is a, a trade-off that is prevalent everywhere in your life. And so when you decide what you eat, am I going to be eating because of, am I going to focus my meal on what I want to eat today that's going to make me feel good today? Or am I going to focus on what's going to make me feel good tomorrow and next week and five years from now and 50 years from now, am I going to eat for longevity, for health, for uh, uh, the long-term outcomes, or am I going to be eating for uh, current satisfaction? Same is true with everything you do in your work. Are you going to be optimizing the actions that you carry out in your work for uh, making a quick buck today, or are you going to be investing in making a uh, a lot of bucks in the future. It's difficult to uh, it's difficult to value the future a lot. But once you see it, and once you become aware of it, I, I found this truly astonishing for me. That once you become aware of this, it's amazing how much more uh, power you have in terms of taking those decisions because you start seeing it everywhere and you start understanding. Okay. The reason my work is always in a mess is because today I'm paying for all of the. Uh, years of high time preference decisions where I prioritized myself one year ago, two years ago, five years ago at the expense of me today. And that's why today I'm paying the price for it. And you can see the same thing with your finances. The reason that I'm broke today is because five years ago, I spent the money that I could have saved and I uh, didn't uh, think about what would be happening today. And so, and, and you see it in your personal relationships with people, the way you deal with people you, in everything. And once you just start seeing that that trade-off exists, it's, it's, it's like you've unlocked a superpower. It's, it's like you start becoming like a, a, a cartoon character who has a magical superpower that allows you to influence things in a really um, profound way that you hadn't thought about. Because now you start thinking, okay, what am I going to eat? There's a high time preference choice. There's a low time preference choice. How am I going to spend my money? There's a low time preference versus high time preference choice. And initially, of course, you know, choosing the low time preference path is initially choosing pain. So if you're broke now because you've spent the last five years spending a lot of money, um, it's not like, all right, I'm going to start choosing low time preference decisions and then I'm going to be rich tomorrow because of it. You're going to get poorer because you're going to, you know, you're already broke. And now instead of taking whatever little money you have and using it to make yourself happy, you're going to start saving some of it. And so you're digging yourself deeper into poverty in a sense in order to take the low time preference decision. But then eventually it begins to pay off. And then eventually you start at least improving. You start seeing yourself that instead of digging yourself deeper, you're at least uh, digging yourself out. So I think it's really, really powerful. Once people become aware of this, just simply by reading about it and thinking about it, it really changes everything because you become aware that this isn't just a choice about what am I going to eat today or how am I going to do this. This is always a trade-off between me today and me in the future. And then once you realize that the, the situation I'm in today is a result of my choices in the past, and the situation I'm going to be in in the future is a um, it's going to be the consequence of the decisions that I take today. Then the uh, the significance of those decisions becomes a lot uh, more profound, and the ability to make sacrifices and to choose the uh, low time preference choice becomes a lot easier. I find, and so I think uh, I'm really excited about this feature. I'm I'm looking forward to. Um, 
seeing how it works out for you guys because I think it's just um, you know putting it in front of somebody that you spent let's say forty five percent of your income on high time preference bullshit last month is just going to make every single one of those high time preference decisions next month taste a lot less sweet you know it's going to it's going to it's going to weigh on you oh no, i'm i'm adding to that number so that next month i'm going to get another 45% high time preference and i don't want to do that i need to be thinking more and more about the future and that's just going to make it easier i think to you know give up on that uh, extra night of drinking or give up on uh, uh, buying these uh, clothes that I don't need or going to places that I don't need to go to. And I think it becomes easier to give these things up once you start seeing it through that lens. This podcast is brought to you by my friends at Coinbits, the oldest Bitcoin-only exchange. If you're listening to this podcast, you get that Bitcoin upends everything that government schools teach about money. Coinbits is the money app designed for people like you who understand Bitcoin and want to use it every day. Coinbits pioneered the concept of roundups, which converts your spare change into Bitcoin. Simply connect your debit and credit cards and your usual purchases are rounded up to the nearest dollar, letting you save more in Bitcoin as you spend more. My favorite new Coinbits feature is Spending Insights, which gives you real-time feedback about how much of your money is chasing high-time preference, short-term gratification, and how much you are providing for your future with low-time preference choices. As always, Coinbits provides a terrific self-custody experience. Connect a hardware wallet for automatic withdrawals, so you keep counterparty risk to a minimum. Coinbits also offers peer-to-peer cash and Bitcoin payments, target orders, price alerts, and more. Coinbits can help you do almost anything you need with Bitcoin. Go to coinbits.app slash Saifedean and get three months free. Again, that is coinbits.app slash Saifedean, S-A-I-F-E-D-E-A-N. Well, yes, it becomes easier because, so I love this, this meme that, um, that, that I've shared several times where it's like, choose your, choose your pain. Is, do you want the pain of discipline or the pain of regret? Right. That's what you're talking about here. And um, <clears throat> but but the but the problem is that the pain of avoiding the pain of regret is incredibly hard because, um, you know, as human beings, like we have to understand that we have like sort of an unchangeable psychology. And I think that Bitcoiners, I mean, you know, Bitcoin religions, there's all of these sort of frameworks that we use to trick ourselves into um, low time preference behaviors that are very painful because we don't have the immediate feedback. Um, You know, even working out, right? Like if, if, if people could get feedback earlier when they're getting in shape, um, the encouragement and the, even the sort of the sensory feedback that they're making some kind of progress, even though there's no progress that, that seems to be happening, um, then they're more likely to uh, continue. So, so really the name of the game for, for, for building technology that does this, because technology is a great tool for it. So you have religion, religious frameworks, you have like, you know, philosophical frameworks. We can do that till we're blue in the face and high functioning people who are, have the intellectual capacity to like integrate those ideas into their daily decision-making. It works for them, not every day, but it works for them better than, than others. Right. But if you're like totally out of practice with this stuff, you're starting from zero. You've never denied yourself uh, immediate gratification. Like, how do you move people out of that state? It's incredibly hard. And, and, you know, repeating the message to them is one way. I think technology is great with managing sensory feedback, right? So like we can do things like we can make it feel good to, to take a low time preference behavior today that will pay off many years from now. We can make that feel good to you in a, in a very, and I, and I don't mean that in sort of a, an abstract way. I literally mean, we can give you visual images that stimulate you that release dopamine, um, or we can create haptic effects in your hands that release dopamine so that when you do something that's good for yourself later, you feel it now. And, um, you know, I, what, what I like to call it is responsible gamification, right? So in product design, we have this concept called gamification where um, we can use some of the mechanics of games to get people to behave a certain way. And that has been you know, that can be used very irresponsibly, that can be weaponized. And we've seen that. And that's why there's a lot of issues with people who have TikTok brain or, you know, basically 
in order to communicate with other people now, even on Twitter, right? Like you're looking for those dopamine hits. Are they gonna like my tweet? Oh, it went viral. I got new followers today. It's this very tight feedback loop with dopamine release. Um, and it's used in the case of Twitter, maybe good in a good way because you're trying to impress people with your erudition and you know, you're, you're trying to kind of like build a reputation amongst very intelligent people. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's better than, you know, maybe let's say TikTok, <clears throat> TikTok and some of the others. Um, but I think we can be even more responsible with gamification and build, like you said, um, build in a, a, uh, a trajectory of sort of expected behaviors and rewards um, that pays off not today, but far in the future, but it feels like it, it pays off today. Um, and the thing is that it pays off also for businesses. So, um, you know, for personal financial management apps, People who use them habitually are 18% wealthier um, than people who don't. And so, you know, when you're building an audience and you, through product design, are able to make them 18% wealthier over the course of a year or two, that you've built trust, you've built like a loyal base of people who, who believe in your message. And frankly, from like a transactional point of view, they're richer, they have more money, you can sell them more things. So it's good for you, the lifetime value of that user has gone up 18%. <clears throat> and so, you know, I think there's a win-win here. The trick is for the business to also have a low time preference and to not sort of be tempted to chase those early wins that ultimately fizzle out. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the Sats card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard Sats card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Yeah, I think this is really a very good way of putting it because ultimately, um, I mean, you can make a lot of money frying people's brains, but <laughs> then, you know, you have fried brains for customers, which is going to be probably problematic down the line, but it is difficult to try and uh, focus on this. And I can sort of understand why uh, th there's an element of smash and grab with tech innovation, it's almost always inevitable that when new things come along, it's just going to make sense to uh, go for the big jackpot that is high time preference that compromises the long term health of the business. And I think you see this quite often. And in a sense, it's almost inevitable because it might even make sense. Like there is just so much reward for uh, getting the uh, early, in a sense, you can see this with, for instance, um, with, with Bitcoin companies that get into shit coins. Like it's probably compromising their ability to um, do Bitcoin in the long term. But at the same time, you're never going to get people, you know, you're never going to have a world that is as clueless about shit coins as the, it is right now. And so it, it kind of makes sense to compromise your long term because you can uh, you can maybe make so much more in the short term. But I think with time, as the market matures, these kind of companies, you know, they make their loot, they do the smash and grab, but then they ruin their reputation. And then in the long run, other kind of companies become more and more trusted over time. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that as well. I mean, I think there, there's also sort of this, um, there's a catch 22, which is, if you believe in the thesis of Bitcoin, then you may be say you may justify it to yourself to say, well, I'm going to do the smash and grab because that will allow me to accrue more Bitcoin more quickly. So it's but 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 I mean, at some point, you have to say like, okay, what am I trying to do here? Um, what are my values? And what do I want to leave to my kids? I mean, when I when my kids were little, and they were like, you know, pretty young and everyone's like, my dad's a lawyer, my dad's a doctor. They asked me like, what, what does my dad do? I want to tell my friends at school. The only thing I can come up with is we're trying to make it so that you can hug people through the internet. When you see your grandparents on a FaceTime call, you can give them a hug. And that like resonated for them. And that was, and that for me, that like, when I said that, I had never really put it that way, but that kept me going. It's the same now. It's sort of like, um, I want to be able to be proud of what I say I do. Um, and, and I think that's, that's maybe 
like un- undervalued uh, in general. And I think when you live in that space, you would never want to go back because it feels so good. And you get really positive feedback from other people too, when you tell them what you do. And um, if it's just, I make a bunch of money, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of prestige that goes along with that. But um, I have found that, that when people explain what they do and it's not something that they are, they truly believe in, there's just this, this, their spirit is just, just sort of depressed and, and, um, and dead. Like it doesn't, it doesn't feel great, you know? And so I think, um, yeah, I think that's, that's a really important thing. It's like you feel <clears throat> when you see these massive international crises and you see, you know, the world going to shit and you see these big problems, you can feel really small and really powerless and you have not very much power, like granted, like you or me, um, we have the platform we have. We don't, we can't really affect these big, uh, these big events as much as perhaps we would like. Um, but we can do, we have scare, our own scarce time. We have a human lifetime and we have a certain number of talents and a certain amount of energy and we can, and we have the freedom to decide how to apply it. And like, that's the power we have. And there's something for me when I think about that, that is, um, it, 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 it lets a peace wash over me to say, okay, like within the constraints that I have, I actually have a lot of leeway, um, to apply my talents and the way that you apply your talents is, is, is your opportunity to, 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 to bend the future. And, and maybe you can't do more than that, but like to the extent that you do have that leeway, use it. Um, and, and, you know, you'll look back on your life, I think with a lot less the regret than people who say I had the chance to, um, to, you know, live my values and I decided to put them aside for, for shorter term concerns. Yeah, I think I agree. I, th- I think you see this quite often, um, and it's um, it's quite interesting. Um, you see this particularly in the bear market. Um, I, I think with shitcoiners, it's very, very common. You see this on Twitter that um, a lot of these shitcoiner accounts get into massive crises of faith, and um, they hate themselves, and they hate being into shitcoins, and uh, they get into these kind of... Uh, th- this entire industry is so bad and everybody's so evil and you look at bitcoin uh, you know bitcoin only people who just have a little a lot more clarity about what they're doing and it's just you know you you'll be driving an uber and stacking sats and there's a, a, a real sense of accomplishment and happiness and peace about it because you're making an honest living you're serving people and you're watching your wealth grow it's not uh, growing very very fast but at least it's not robbing you as is the case with uh, fiat and so you see you see an optimism about the future which bitcoin allows you and which a short short uh, short time horizon high time preference uh, degen gambling doesn't quite uh, afford to Absolutely. Uh, optimism is so important. And um, that's why I'm, that's what I'm most grateful to Bitcoin for, honestly, everything else aside, um, you know, it was the difference between saying, I can see where the trajectory we're on, we're all going to be engagement slaves, like living in pods and basically become, uh, you know, attention, attention batteries for big corporations. And I, there's really no way around it. Um, until I until I discovered Bitcoin, and I think Bitcoin actually is a is a reason for optimism but but not only um on a human level but for technology i mean um i think that bitcoin has a role to play in this next era of technology development i really see these a few big macro trends um that are converging right now so there's bitcoin uh there's nuclear power you know a new power renaissance around around stable clean nuclear power uh, and then there's ai and the three have to play th- all three of them depend on each other. Bitcoin may be less than dependent on the other two, but the other two depend on Bitcoin uh, to make this work. But with Bitcoin in the mix, because it's an honest ledger and because it is, um, it, it, it can enable, uh, you know, we talk about human action, um, you know, being um, how humans behave uh, in an environment of scarcity. Um, well, we're going into an era now, which is unprecedented in human history. And I'm actually really interested how Austrians are going to think about agents and agent action. Because it's the first time that you're going to have these technological constructs. They have, I mean, if, if, if by any definition, they have motivation, <clears throat> they have goals, 
they exist in an environment of scarcity. They need to coordinate their action with other agents, with people. You know, the scarcity is in compute and in power. Um, and, and they're, and they're going to need to coordinate their action. And they are black boxes, just like humans are, right? So they're going to value things um, to meet their own goals that like we can't really, we can't unpack why that has value uh, beyond the fact that it just has subjective value to that agent. Um, but this is all going to be happening at the speed of light. And it's going to be happening uh, at a scale that we can't even comprehend. And the only ledger that will work for the coordination of agent action, I believe, is Bitcoin, um, because it allows for um, the, the, the granular micropayments that you need to be able to transmit value um, at the at the kind of the scale that they need. Um, and then frequency, which is still a problem. But, uh, you know, I think with layer two and so on, we're going to be able to get high enough frequency payments that that's going to start to make sense. Um, but but Bitcoin creating an efficient market for for agents to be able to utilize resources is going to cause an explosion in productivity and human quality of life that I think uh, very few of us can even envision right now. Yeah. All right. Um, next thing I want to talk about is uh, what happened with Coinbits and uh, Prime Trust. Um, so that was... Uh, a couple of years ago when, uh, well, actually not a couple of years ago, it was a year ago. Um, when, it was June, uh, 2023. Yeah. yeah, it was a year, it was a year, 13 months ago when uh, Prime Trust declared bankruptcy and uh, you guys had a bunch of uh, Bitcoin with them. So tell us how that worked out. Yeah, well, I mean, the short answer is that it's not done yet. And I'm going to be able to tell you a little bit, but obviously I, I can't speak too much about it. First of all, because I'm not an attorney, but also because things are still in flight. Uh, it's been it's been a long time. Um, you know, we are in touch with so so basically the the this is the story um, as far as I understand it from reading the court filings. So Prime Trust lost eighty two million dollars or, or thereabouts in Ethereum. They just literally lost their keys. Um, then, as some of their partners and customers needed to withdraw Ethereum. They were just purchasing Ethereum on the fly to kind of backfill that need uh, with some of the fiat of some of the other clients. That led to a liquidity crisis and uh, things fell apart from there. Now, in the court filings, there's actually no um, mention of Bitcoin or loss of Bitcoin, which we think is really positive. Um, again, so, so just kind of backing up, Prime Trust was our liquidity provider and our access to fiat rails. Um, they were very standard uh, company to work with in the Bitcoin space back when they were operating. Uh, fortunately, they acted um, somewhere between negligent, irresponsibly, criminally, nobody knows, uh, but, but it blew up, right? And, um, you know, in the lead up to that time, um, in the year before, we had, e even a year before that, we had these, uh, we, we had a request to kind of like make self-custody and withdrawals easy. So we built that all out. So you could always withdraw your Bitcoin from Coinbits, but a lot of people, even people who knew better, just sort of left it there. And we all know that it's like really easy to just leave your assets with an exchange because it just seems uh, more convenient. And I, I do think that there's product design work there that, that we've done since then to make that even easier, um, which we can talk about. But, but basically, you know, you had a certain number of Prime Trust account holders. Um, that were also Coinbits members that, that had Bitcoin on Prime Trust that's still not accessible. Um, we're, we're in touch with the, uh, the trust that is now in possession of Prime Trust assets. There hasn't been a lot of movement on it. Um, and it's one of those things where, you know, the, the wheels of justice turn slowly. Um, their deadline is early November to uh, reconcile the assets of Prime Trust. We have no reason to believe that the date will will slip again. It could. It's unlikely, I think. Um, and so we're sort of trying to coordinate with that trust um, how that would work. Frankly, until the de date is closer, I can't expect you know too much more back and forth. It's just there's not a lot of forward motion. Uh, that's just how these things work. And then as the date approaches, you start to see more more back and forth and more action. Um, so that's sort of where we are. It is very unfortunate because, again, like in, in finance, in money, right, it's all about trust and, um, and prime trust, which was supposedly, you know, not a bank, not rehypothecating. All they're doing is holding your assets for you as a courtesy to you, uh, but they're your assets and they're your private property um, that, that wound up 
I guess not not being as true as as we had hoped. There's always these gray areas, and um, and so again, no reason to believe the Bitcoin's gone, but still not resolved, and and we're 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 kind of watching it closely, and uh, we're we're working with a new custodian now, but um, that custodian uh, has a very strict limit on the amount of of Bitcoin that they'll even allow you to hold with them. We we've really uh, streamline the process of withdrawing your Bitcoin. We, we allow you to connect a hardware wallet now um, so that you can actually use CoinBits sort of as, as, a, as a wallet app. It's a web app, so it's in the cloud. Um, and so it's not the most private thing in the world. If you care about your ultra, ultra private stash that's in cold storage that you want nobody to know you have, you know, don't connect that wallet to CoinBits. That's for you. Um, but, but to have a hardware device that gives you the security of hardware but minus a little bit of the privacy in exchange for the convenience of having, you know, a connection to a web app and being able to manage your spending, your balances, and even eventually we'll be able to allow you to, to sign transactions using the web app. Um, we, we think that that's a really good trade-off, you know, trading off a little bit of privacy for higher security and sort of lower friction to getting your Bitcoin off the platform. This podcast is also brought to you by The Bitcoin Way your professional Bitcoin IT team, offering you personalized, secure, and comprehensive solutions for every step along your Bitcoin journey. The Bitcoin Way offer live concierge service to guide you with your Bitcoin cold storage, running your node, privacy best practices, inheritance planning, corporate strategy, and multi-sig solutions. They don't touch your coins, they guide you through the process of acquiring your coins and securing them. If you'd like to make your setup safer and more reliable, book a consult with them and see what they have to suggest. If you want to give someone the gift of Bitcoin, get them this professional service that will ensure they start off knowing exactly how to manage their coins and not lose them. Go to thebitcoinway.com and start Bitcoining more confidently. Yeah, so tell us more about uh, what you're doing in terms of product design to make this uh, easier. Oh, sure. So Make um, self-custody easier, I should say. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, so, so it's that hardware wallet connection. So what that means is you're able to um, connect a hardware device. We're able to uh, uh, acquire your device descriptor and we're able to generate new wallet addresses for you and automatically, you know, send your, send your Bitcoin uh, on either a basis of a threshold, so a certain amount or on a time interval. So every week or every day, whatever you want. Um, and then when, when that happens, you know, you can also see all of your transactions and all, and your, eventually your UTXOs, we don't have that quite yet, but we able to see your UTXOs from inside the app. And again, going back to this idea of personal financial management, right? Um, you want, again, not your super secret stash, but like for the KYC Bitcoin that you have, you probably don't need to keep that ultra private and you want to be able to see kind of everything in one place, your net worth, um, you know, you're able to then, uh, like I said before, if, if you have upcoming fiat liabilities, um, because we see in your transaction history that you have to pay certain bills every month, it's very likely that you'll have to pay them next month. We can actually, you can set up your own automation. This isn't here yet, but this is the vision. You set your own automation up to be able to sign a transaction, to be able to like move, um, uh, Bitcoin onto the platform, convert it to fiat and have it ready just in time to pay those bills. So, um, so like I said, I think, um, you know, there's an opportunity to, to uh, sort of integrate Bitcoin experiences with traditional money management experiences. It's never been done. Hardware devices and connectivity with hardware is a part of that. It's not this thing like dangling on the side where, oh, you have this weird device that sits in your desk and never gets touched and it holds your ultra ultra cold storage like there's a place for that but there's also a place for like a a day-to-day bitcoin device that connects to your main money app yeah and uh yeah i think that's uh that's inevitably going to be the case i think yeah as you said earlier it's uh it's tempting to just want to move off fiat completely but realistically, um, most of us are going to have a lot of liabilities in fiat for the foreseeable future, unfortunately. And it's it's tempting to just go very um, 
uh, you know, just hold everything in Bitcoin and then immediately sell Bitcoin whenever you need to send to pay anything with fiat. But I think, in retrospect, that's probably not very, uh, very wise and probably doesn't pay off in the long run because I think there's a lot of short term volatility in Bitcoin that makes this kind of strategy effectively like uh, short term trading. And uh, there is a lot of money that you're going to be. Um, staking on short-term price movements. If you're buying uh, Bitcoin or if you're earning Bitcoin today and then you're having to sell it throughout the month, then you yeah, yeah, you might end up being a lot worse off because of the way in which the price fluctuates during that month. So, I mean, I, I, I get the kind of idea of wanting to be pure about it and just trying to hold as much Bitcoin as you can, but then... I, you can you can see why that is actually counterproductive because ultimately what you want for you personally and for Bitcoin, if you want Bitcoin to win, what you want is more Bitcoin holding. The more Bitcoin you hold, the more you're helping Bitcoin win. And so anything that you do that ends up costing you more Bitcoin and end up letting you have less Bitcoin in the long run is likely counterproductive. So you don't want to be a financial martyr effectively losing money in order to take a stand because realistically taking stands and um, uh, making these gestures isn't what's going to matter ultimately what's going to move the needle is how much bitcoin people are willing to hold on to and at what value and so the more people hold the more valuable the bitcoins the more we win, the more liquidity there is in Bitcoin, the more opportunities for people to trade Bitcoin with one another, the more the ability for people to um, find counterparties that are in Bitcoin. So it's all in my mind, it all goes back to being able to hold more. And I'm not sure that uh, just holding the most at any point in time is the right way to go about it because you have a lot of fiat liabilities. So you want to work on trying to reducing your fiat liabilities, maybe by moving to a place like El Salvador, where you can start uh, paying more and more things with Bitcoin. But um, realistically, uh, you also, you don't want to ruin yourself financially, destroy your business, or uh, destroy your financial well-being. Uh, so you need to look out for uh, what's going to work best. What are your thoughts on that? And how, how are you guys thinking of this uh, trade-off? Yeah, no. So the reasoning that you just followed there is is the common reasoning that everybody's going to go through, but they're going to have different conclusions that that they draw, right? So our goal, and this and this comes back to kind of full circle to musical instrument design and interface design. Um, when you're designing an interface, if you're if you can design it so that it has a purpose and it does that purpose very efficiently, but it's flexible enough for people to use it in ways that you never expected. That is a tremendously powerful concept because that means that you understand the human mind, the human body, such that you're able to get something done that isn't, but, but the interface is not so rigid um, that you can't improvise and use it in new ways, right? I mean, even like the turntable was designed to be, you know, a, a music playback appliance and it became an expressive instrument. And the reason it did was because, you know, the, the the disc the the spinning platter wasn't locked in. You could like move it back and forth. There's certain things like uh, I, I guess you call them degrees of freedom uh, in the interface that allow you to build your own experience. And the same is is true here, right? So you may so one person may be like, no, I want to try living on a Bitcoin standard, and I want to see if I can make money by holding through that volatility as much Bitcoin as possible. And there's models that say that that may or may not work. And there's other people that are like. Look, um, you know, the dollar is a fiat utility is a Fed utility token. You have to it, it's required in order for certain for certain things. Um, I'm I'm dipping my toes. I'm going to use some of these automation tools to to um, expose myself, you know, to, to Bitcoin in a certain way that works for me. So I think the key is, you know, while I said you need to be able to build an opinionated product, that teaches people the values of the company and sort of what you're trying to impart. Um, you also need to build flexibility into the system so that people can use, use, use your product in an unexpected way. And that really then feeds back into the product design because you observe users doing that 
And that leads to new ideas. I mean, I explained how we already did that uh, and, and that's how we arrived here. Now, if we build um, an automation feature that allows you to uh, obtain, you know, just in time fiat exposure only for your liabilities, you know, hopefully we're going to do that in a way that isn't so anticipated anticipatory of your needs that you're locked into a course of action. Instead, we'll give you the freedom to set up those automations and then we'll go back and look at how people are using them and that may feed back into the product as well and, and make it more intelligent. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by Orange Pill App, the Bitcoin-only social network that connects you with high-signal Bitcoiners, events, and now merchants as well. If you're like me and can't stop talking about Bitcoin, you know how challenging it can be to talk to the no-coiners and how nice it is to talk to someone who gets you. With the Orange Pill App, you can find the Bitcoiners near you and they can replace the no-coiners in your life. You can organize events and meetups with local Bitcoiners and wherever you travel, you can meet up with local Bitcoiners all while being as anonymous as you like like. So if you want to build your local network of Bitcoiners, find a Bitcoin meetup or merchants accepting Bitcoin, head over to orangepillapp.com to sign up or download the app from the App Store or Google Play Store and send me a DM so we can get connected. Um, all right, what else uh, do you guys have planned? Um, what other uh, things do you see in the uh, future for you? Well, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're entering a very interesting time from a business perspective as a Bitcoin company. Um, this era that we're entering into, you know, finance, banking, for better, for worse, probably for worse, it's uh, very heavily constrained by regulation. It's a very, it's an ossified industry. Uh, it's, it's, it's regulated very, very closely. <clears throat> and your, your possibility for action within finance is, is very constrained. I worked, um, you know, not, not so much, but I have a, a small amount of experience with medical devices and it's very similar. Like you, 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 there's a lot of cool stuff you would want to be able to do, but you just know that you're never going to get it past the regulators. Um, and you know, again, I, I, I'm just feeling optimistic lately. I think that um, the the developments, the political developments in the United States, um, which is our market, um, are pointing to an era. You know, with the elimination of the Chevron um, jurisprudence uh, and you know the um, kind of the bipartisan interest in Bitcoin as evidenced by SAB 121 and FIT 21, you know, you're kind of seeing like, okay, there's one party that is including Bitcoin in its platform and not the other one. I think though that it is a bipartisan issue and I'm, I'm very excited about this idea that we're going to buy into the, you know, the, the trifecta I talked about, like we need to be a leader in AI. We need to be a leader in nuclear. We, we can no longer afford to have these luxury beliefs um, that nuclear is dangerous. And then we need Bitcoin and, and, and Web3 and crypto and so on, which gets kind of thrown in with all of that with politicians and, and their agendas. Um, and so you're going to see a loosening of regulations. <clears throat> I think what, what, what they'll do is um, ultimately w banks are going to be able to participate and, and um, you know, traditional finance um, companies, which we're already seeing with like the ETFs, are going to be able to participate and create these experiences for people. Um, you know, banks today, they spend a lot on distribution, but that's not really their core competency. They've really struggled to create compelling digital experiences for people, um, branded experiences, but they're really good at managing a ledger. They're really good <clears throat> at, at custody, um, at compliance. And so that's going to be what they do. They're going to be uh, you know, there's some people that say headless banks, right? So the bank is going to become headless. It's responsible for compliance and the relationship. Um, it maintains the licensure and the charter, but they're going to partner with technology companies that are much better at the distribution side. And I think that um, Bitcoin is going to be something that banks are going to be able to do, uh, participate in more, either at arm's length or maybe even integrating custody services. Um, and so, you know, the, the total available market for Bitcoin, because, because a lot of the uncertainty with compliance is, well, some of it is, has been removed. It's, it's now clear that banks are responsible there. And so that's actually helpful because at least roles are clear. Um, but, then, but then you also sort of have this, this bubbling up and we'll see how it turns out with this election and beyond. But, but I really see, you know, we're not moving towards a draconian, uh, you know, increase in regulation and decrease in, um, 
in people's access to Bitcoin. I just don't see it. Maybe a year ago, I would have said differently, but I really feel the momentum shifting. So what we're really excited about is to play in that space. I mean, the sky's the limit. Like these banks and fintech companies are going to need Bitcoin infrastructure and Bitcoin software to be able to serve the businesses and enterprise customers and retail customers that they need to. And so anybody working in Bitcoin today, I think it behooves any company to think of their of their product, their app, even Coinbits um, or, or other you know companies that, that come to mind for you. Obviously, um, their product is a is is kind of more of a reference design or a proof of concept for the infrastructure that they can provide to this new economy. And you'll see uh, sort of Bitcoin companies take advantage of that by productizing sort of the infrastructure and moving up the stack and being able to um, pr- provide that, that infrastructure. And then you'll have the fintechs who are really good at distribution and branding be kind of the, the face of all of that as banks are over here responsible for compliance and uh, licensure and charters. Yeah, excellent. Well, I wish you guys all the best of luck. I really hope uh, things work out. And I think um, all of the prime trust thing, hopefully, uh, should, I, I hope, um, get settled because I, I mean, I'm optimistic it's not that big of a hole to dig um, uh, to dig yourselves out of. And I think you have a lot of uh, goodwill because you've done a lot of good work for a lot of people and have helped Orange build a lot of people. So uh, wish you guys the best of luck. Uh, tell us more about uh, your work and Coinbits. When pe- where can people find out about it? Sure. So um, you can find Coinbits at coinbits.app. Um, so it's a web app today. Uh, people get confused by that. They look for us in the app store. We, ha- we don't have a native app quite yet. Um, and there are reasons for that. <clears throat> we may build one later this year, but for now you go to the web. So coinbits.app, you can do it on a mobile device. It's actually, the, the, the experience is great. And if you take a, take a look, I think you'll find that um, our UX is maybe head and shoulders above a lot of the other Bitcoin companies. So we're really, really proud of what we've built. It's, it's visually stunning. Um, the animations and everything is is there to teach you how Bitcoin actually works, but in a way that holds your hand. And um, so, so check us out there, sign up, um, link your bank accounts. And, and I think that's that's really what I want to plug more than anything else is just that website, coinbits.app. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dave. I wish you all the best. Take care. Thank you, Safe. Talk to you soon. Cheers, man. Take care. Bye-bye.